Grab your Bibles. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Yeah. Um, on Galatians chapter 5, um, just a word I want to share from you there just to encourage you. I want to, um, as we've been talking on this series of uh, establishing, reestablishing the kingdom of God, um, today my focus for a few minutes is just to pick up where we left off. About two weeks ago, God had his way last week, but I just want to walk you through a couple of things to say, to help you know that we can walk in victory. 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 Amen? Repeat after me. Say self. I've got the victory. One more time. Say self. I've got the victory. This is where you need one of those Church of God in Christ organists and drummer, right? Because in the name of Jesus, y'all remember that? In the name, yeah, we have the victory. See, y'all just Baptist folk, come on. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Satan, Satan, you have to flee. That's all I know, good, yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, tell me something, tell me, tell me who can stand before us, who can something that... That great name, I know this part, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory, amen. Yeah, that's it, that's it. The problem with the church, right, is that we've been in church too long, and we forgot why those songs were written. We forgot why those songs existed. We've become CCM'd, that's contemporary Christian music, and we've forgotten the theology and the messages behind some of that song. I imagine somebody might have been struggling with something and they went to church and they heard a preacher or maybe God spoke to them and say to them, you have the victory. The enemy has nothing over you. And every now and then we need to be reminded of that. So I want to remind you this morning of whose we are that we've been talking about reestablishing the kingdom of God. And so here's what I want you to take away from you this morning. When we unify with Christ, it enables us, it enables people, it enables believers to walk in victory. And let me tell you why I seem a little so excited about that this morning. It's because I know sometimes I will have low moments And I know sometimes the enemy will try to seize or capitalize on that low moment to get me to do something stupid. Y'all might as well say amen because I'm not talking about myself. Amen? I've got that problem, but I know some of you, if you're human like me, you have the same problem. When we have those low moments, the enemy will capitalize on that to try to get us to do something uh, foolish or to not walk in the victory that we have in Christ. But as we've been talking about this series and been going through this, I just want to encourage you this morning just through Scripture to let you see who we are and what God has done with us. So go to Galatians chapter 2. Let me read verse 20, and then we're going to walk through just a series of Scriptures that I hope will make sense to you to empower you and enable you to go on this morning. Now, here's what verse 20 says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, humor me for a while and just repeat after me. Say, self, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you don't do nothing else today, I'm hoping you get a good understanding of this passage of Scripture to help you understand what it means to be unified with Christ and what it means to walk in victory. Now, we've been hinting for the past few weeks about this concept or this issue of being unified with Christ. Katani and I have been married a long time. And the longer we married, the more she becomes predictable and the more I become predictable. And you know how this works in marriage, right? The man can never figure the woman out. Come on, fellas. Y'all know I'm right. Come on, fellas. Help a brother out now. We can never figure her out. But man, she can figure us out in her sleep. And then we get punished for not knowing her. Amen. Y'all know me by now. You know, y'all know how this works, right? So, so the longer we walk with Christ, the closer we become to Christ. 
And the moment we give our lives to Christ, I want you to hear me say this morning, we become one with Christ. And that's an important concept, an important theology that I want us to walk through this morning so we can be walking the victory that God has in store for us. Here's what it means when I say or when I use the term union with Christ. Here's what union with Christ means. Union with Christ means this, that it is a phrase used to summarize several different relationships between believers and Christ through which uh, Christians receive every benefit. Come on, say every benefit. Every. Say it again. Say every benefit. Every. every benefit of salvation. These relationships include the fact that we are in Christ, Christ is in us, we are like Christ, and finally, we are with Christ. So I'm just going to be talking about those four things this morning, and I'm going to look at Scripture to let Scripture kind of help us under, uh, amplify that. Number one, because here's the four things we're going to, to talk through this morning, that union with Christ means four things. If you, don't, if you can't go into no huge statement of what union with Christ means, grab this in your spirit. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. We are like Christ, and we are with Christ. Repeat after me. Say, I am in Christ. Come on, Christ is in me. I am like Christ, and I am with Christ. Oh, that sounds so good. Say it again. Say, say I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I am like Christ, and I am with Christ. So we're going to walk through this in Scripture, just these four things real quick, because this is what union with Christ means, and you're going to get a feel of what the text means. So notice how it opens up by saying, right? At the point on the bottom, the verse opens up by saying, I have been crucified with Christ. And, and don't miss the present tense or what's nuanced in the grammar of the verse, I have been crucified crucified with Christ. And the first thing I want you to take away is that you are in Christ. That's very, very, very important. You are in Christ. So to understand that, go with me to Ephesians. Just go to the couple of pages over. And we read this last week. I want to read it again. I want to say some of the same things that I said last week because I want you to understand what this is all about. Then we'll do it, okay? Notice what the text says in Ephesians chapter 3. Um, let me just, chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 3. If you're there, say amen. amen. Here's what it says, and this is the importance of bringing your Bible. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Even as, look at verse 4, he chose us in him when? Before the what? Why? That we should be holy and blameless before him in love, in our love, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Let me read that one more time in case somebody missed it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy, blameless, and before him in love he predestined us for adoption as son in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the beauty of being in Christ. Now, hear me say this and let's walk through this first thing. When it says, I have have been crucified with Christ. So understand with me, your relationship with God did not begin when you gave your heart to him as Lord and Savior. All right. I'm going to say it again because some of y'all are lost right now. Your relationship with God did not begin when you gave your life to him as Lord and Savior. If you understand what this book says, before the foundations of the world, God saw you. You got to. He, I love this. He had a purpose that he wanted done in the earth realm. And because of God's purposes, because of God's design, because of him being the all-knowing, the all-wise, the all-powerful God, he looked into time. And as he looked into time, way down at a particular point in time, in a particular location, he said, I needed you to come to me here to do this for me in the earth realm. And he meant understand what that's saying. That's, I said it this way last week. That's before Genesis 1 and 1 began. 
Oh, you got to get this, okay? He chose this where before time even began, right? And then lock into this. Here's what I said last week. Then he set things in motion, and Genesis 1 and 1 happened, where it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then Genesis chapter 3 happened, where the enemy came in, and the enemy messed up God's creation. But does anybody know there's nothing the enemy can do to annihilate God's plan for the world? Come on, does anybody get this with me? So lock into this. In Genesis chapter 3, he prophesied that at some point in time, he was going to send his man, his son, in the earth to redeem earth. Now, here's what happened on Calvary. When Jesus came on Calvary, he died on that cross for Calvary. He died for sins that began in Genesis 1 and 1 to sins that has not even been committed yet. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I, I, I messed up and used the word prepaid last week, right? He, he died for sins that have not yet been committed. And, and understand this. So, so here's what happens. When I sin today, now assuming I'm a Christian and I gave my heart to Christ, if I understood that God chose me before time began, my sin does not surprise him. So when I blow it, 1 John 1 and 9 says, I've got to do what? Confess my sin because he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse from all unrighteousness. So what the phrase, I have been crucified with Christ, mean, when I give my life to Christ, I am aligning with God's will and I identify with what happened on Calvary and he stamps me when I come to him saying, sealed, already paid for. Now, if you understand that, all the enemy can do is come whisper in my ear and try to make me feel guilty for something God has already taken care of. Come on, y'all. Let me see if this illustration is fit. The enemy's like an old debt collector, right? So here's what happened. You owe a debt. Well, let me put myself in this. I owe a debt. And Jesus wipes it clean. And here's what the enemy comes behind. He comes and he buys that old debt. And for the rest of my life, he nags me to try to get me to repay something that's already paid. Oh, you got to get this. For my entire life, he tries to nag me to repay something that's already paid. And I've got to understand what I'm crucified with Christ with. So here's what he says. Whenever I feel guilty, here's what he does. He goes back into my past. Remember in 1999 when you did this and you messed up? You need to, that, don't you feel guilty? Don't you feel stupid? And dumb me because I don't understand what I'm crucified with Christ with means. Here's what I do. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I need to walk in victory, and I've got to be able to say to that booger, on Calvary 2,000 years ago, I have been crucified with Christ, already paid for, try again. Oh, I need somebody in here. I need somebody in here. And then he'll come up with some stupid stuff. You'll mess up. He'll come again. Remember that one? Remember that one? Don't you feel guilty? Don't you feel bad? And then here's what I've got to constantly say to myself. Over 2,000 years ago on Calvary, already paid for. Try again. And then he's going to say, yeah, but you just did it. Uh, that's, that's a new one. God didn't know about that. And I've got to say to him, you don't know my God. That he invented not to know what to know. Come on. Before knowledge began, he existed. Try again. Are you with me? And if we can understand who we are in Christ. Come on now. So here's what Paul says. I've been crucified with Christ a thousand years ago. And, and, and remember the, the opening phrase when I define union, we've got to learn, we must learn to enjoy all the benefits of our salvation. All the benefits of our salvation. Sometimes we, we, we blame the Holy Spirit for games the enemy plays. Here's what you do. You'll mess up. And then you'll walk around saying, well, God is convicting me. No, God forgave you. The enemy is trying to get you to repay a debt that's already been 
Yeah, y'all getting it now. You getting it now. You getting it now. Maybe the Spirit might prompt you to repent, but God's love never changes. Come on, does this make sense? He is always there, so I have been crucified with Christ, so I am with him. I am in union with him. I am one with him. I am in relationship with him. Come on, does that make sense? So here's what that means. Not only am I with Christ, Christ is with me. This is important, okay? I identify with Calvary, and if I hang out at the foot of the cross, whenever something happened, I say, paid for, paid for, paid for, paid for, paid for. Are you with me? Now, here's what I've been saying on Wednesday night in case you've been, been missing Wednesday night. Now, don't have the same sin over and over. And keep coming out the paid, no, 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 no. You got a problem. Are you with me? We should grow past those things. Does that make sense? But here's the thing. It also means that Christ is with me. So here's what Paul says. It is no longer I who live. When you look at Galatians 20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives where? It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives where? Let me say this real fast. Let me say this real fast. That doesn't mean, and let me tell you what that means. The old Felix when I give my life to Christ, is dead, is buried, and a new person emerges, okay? Let, let Scripture talk. Go with me, go with me. What's that? Ephesians 4, go over to Ephesians 4. Let me read this one. This one is just very, very, very excited. Ephesians 4, and look with me at 22. Ephesians 4 and 22. And, and if you're there... Say amen when you're there. Amen. Notice what it says. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former nate manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in your spiritual minds to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness. Right? So I give my heart to Christ when it says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. When I come to Christ, there is a process that God takes me to called sanctification where he kills the old man, the new man emerges, but I've got to learn how to let the new man live so Christ could live in me. So who I was yesterday, and, and here's the thing that I want, that, what I love, what Galatians says, every day a death needs to take place. Does this make sense? Every day I need to die again and continue to live. Every day I need to allow God to reign in me and to live in me. Because look at what the text says. It says, it is Christ who lives in me. Go over to Romans. Go over to Romans. Come on, a couple of pages over. Romans chapter, what is that? Chapter 8, verses 9 and 11. Let me read that one. This is just exciting stuff. Romans 8, verses 9 and 11. Here's what it says. Say amen if you're there. You, however, it says, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Notice what it says. If in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although your body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells where? In you, watch this, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who does what? Dwells in you. Now, I got to belabor this point just for a little while for us to understand what's happening, okay? So here's what the text is saying. When I come to Christ, the old man dies. The old man is done away with. The old man is gone. The old man is finished with. I'm giving, get very, very practical here. Christ comes in, and Christ takes residence in me. So here is the, I am with Christ, and Christ is with me, and Christ is in me. Here's how I've been saying it a couple of weeks ago. The problem is, the flesh has been alive for so long that the flesh really feels as if it's in control. I should have got at least four amens. Come on, y'all. The flesh is always in control. But here's what I want you to understand. On the inside of you, you have a turbo boost. <laughs> you have something in you that is more powerful than the flesh. 
The problem is we don't know how to step on the pedal hard enough. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come on, you get where I'm going, right? And so here's what happened. The flesh speaks and we access the spirit, but we don't know how to press hard enough to get to the spirit. And because we don't press hard enough, the flesh still wins. And so here's what happened. We are saved. We have been made new legitimately. The flesh comes, and here's what the Spirit says. Don't do it, but for some reason, the flesh still gets up, and the flesh does it. Oh, say amen, y'all. I'm not talking just to myself. Are you with me? Here's what Paul is trying to get to understand in the book of Romans. If you understand who is on the inside and how to access what's on the inside, the spirit man will win every single time if you let God have control. So let me tell you what this looked like. Let's assume for a moment you have a weakness and the flesh says, you know you want to go to that euphoria shop. So none of y'all know what that is, amen. And you're like, yeah. And you sit there and you say, Lord, you got to help me. If you sit there and negotiate with the flesh, you're going to lose. Y'all get it. Five minutes later, after you get done praying, you're going to still be It's no different than Eve, right? She engaged the serpent in what? Dialogue. And as long as you keep engaging the flesh in dialogue, the flesh is going to win every time. So here's what I'm trying to get you to understand with the new man. You need to learn to literally get up and do something different. Oh, I, wish, I wish I had somebody in here. Literally get up and do something different that will deny the flesh the desires that it has. This is extreme, but imagine if your weakness has such control of you that it is literally, literally driving you and pressing you to go fail or to do something stupid. Imagine for a moment, if you fight that thing by getting up where you are, pressing hard enough, if you've got to come in this place and lay on that altar for 10 to 12 hours until that feeling is gone, I am guaranteeing you the spirit is going to win every single time. It's called redirection. So when the flesh says yes, you tap into the spirit so the spirit can tell the flesh no. And sometimes you have to keep saying it a million times over and over and over again because that's called pressing in hard enough to overdrive. And the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. Let me help y'all. Let me help y'all. Let me tell you how this works realistically, then I'm going to move on. Several years ago, I had cancer, and the doctor told me to change my diet, so I don't do salt, right? And at first, when I stopped eating salt, food was nasty. Amen. Excuse me, y'all, I'm black. Salt and black go together. <laughs> Amen. It does. It really does. Come on, y'all. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of y'all got salt in your purse now. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. <laughs> right. Well, hot sauce at least, something, right? <laughs> right. But, but lock into this, lock into this. The longer I denied myself salt, the more my body adjusted. It's been 10 years now. I can look at salt and taste the saltiness. You kind of get where I'm going? Because my body has developed the mechanisms to resist. At first, it was not easy. You get what crucified with Christ me, what Christ is in me? So here's what that means. The more I let the God in me rise to the surface, the more natural it becomes over time. Oh, come on, somebody say amen, right? So, so don't fool yourself. Hey, I got saved today. I'm supposed to be here today. No, 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 no. You've been lost for a long time. Come on, y'all. A long, y'all, y'all not hearing me. A long time. Are you with me? And, 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 and you built up some lost muscles 
Amen. And those lost muscles naturally drive us to do lost things. We need to develop some safe muscles that are stronger than the lost muscles to enable us to make it in the world. And I want to stand before you to say that you have the victory, you have the power, you have everything within you to be able to make it. Here's what John 15 says. We don't have time to go there. I am the vine, you are the branches. Do what? Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot abide by itself. The more I stay in Christ, the more I grow in Christ, the more or the less the enemy comes because he recognizes who I am. Come on, say, I'm in Christ. Say, Christ is in me. Come on, a couple more, then we'll be done. Now watch this one real quick. So I am like Christ, and I am also with Christ. Two important concepts, and we don't have time to go to the Scriptures, but let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what it means when it says, I am like Christ. Here's what that means. <sighs> scripture says it this way. Beloved, now are we sons and daughters of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be like, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him. So here's this. You've heard me hint at this. The kingdom is now, and the kingdom is not yet. So if Jesus came and walked the earth and did not sin, and if it's truth that I am like Christ, if I put these biblical practices in place, not saying that I will be perfect, don't make that mistake, but I can have dominion while on the earth, such that whenever the enemy comes, whatever Jesus did, I should be able to do. Come on, y'all. That's the benefit of kingdom now. I can share in his power. Come on. I can share in his blessings. I can say, but, but don't make the mistake of equating spiritual blessings with worldly blessings. This is the fallacy of what's happening in the church today. Here's what people say. Because you know God, you're not supposed to get sick. Because you know God, you're not supposed to be broke. Because you, no, 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 don't, don't, don't equate spiritual blessing because God's kingdom is not of this world. Though I can be, though I can receive, though I can, all that stuff. But the goal is I can be like Christ and I can receive all the benefits that he has. He has blessed us. And here's the more important thing. Every, Grandma and I used to have this song that says, every day with Jesus is what? Sweeter than the day before. Come on, come on, saints, y'all help me. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. So, so, so lock into to this. Imagine if I wake up in the morning and I realize that every step I make, Jesus is walking hand in hand with me. If I realize that, the likelihood of me saying, hey, Jesus, let's go over to this joint over here. Or, hey, Jesus, let's go commit this sin. Or, hey, Jesus, let's go do this misdeed. If I realize who is walking with me every day, it changes my destination. I was sharing with some of the brothers, there used to be a time back in the day where if you were out on the street and a gang was chasing you, you could run in the church and the gang would stop outside and they said, I'm going to wait here till you come out of there. Nowadays, you see what's happening, they're coming in. You kind of get, but there used to be a time. I, I, I painted that picture to say this. If we realize who we're walking with, oh, Lord Jesus. If we realize whose presence we're in, you know, when the enemy comes, all you got to do, Jesus, he must not have seen you sitting right here. <laughs> Come on, y'all, that changes things. The victory we have, because notice Jesus, he, he knew the presence of God was with him every step of the way, and the likelihood of him failing, the benefits of being crucified with Christ was minimal, because notice what he says, the life I now live, I live in the flesh after the Son of God who loved me and did what gave himself for me. So I want us to get this real quick. You got to get this in your spirit. Unifying with Christ enables me to walk in victory. Here's what happens. Katani and I go on vacation a lot. And when we go on vacation, uh, we're always walking. Come on, go walk with a walk with brother for a little while. Forget your feet. Come walk with a brother. Talk about your feet, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. If, if I'm walking with her, hand in hand, ain't too many women around that I'm going to look at. Yeah. Fellas, come on, y'all help a brother out. Because I know she got a free hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you kind of get where I'm going, right? And, and here's the thing, if we understand that because we're one, when we are walking with God consistently, the likelihood of us failing God is reduced. Come on, y'all. The likelihood is reduced. But sometimes, sometimes, here's what you can sit down, baby. Here's what we do. Here's what we do. We leave God at home and we sneak out. And we wonder why the problem. If we understand union with Christ, let me go back up here. Union with Christ. Here's what it means, right? I am in him. He is in me, I am like him, and we are with him. Like this. And if we stay like this, I've been crucified with him, nevertheless I live, and the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself with me. So here's what my life looked like. I'm on a basketball court and somebody fouls me. And here's what I say. You better be glad Jesus is on my team. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Right? I'm driving down the street. You cut me off. Here's what I said. You better be glad Jesus is in the passenger seat. <laughs> At home, something goes crazy, right? And an argument is about to ensue. This is practical application. Here's what crucified with Christ and life in the flesh after Christ means, right? You best be glad he's right here because he's protecting me and preventing me from letting you see me. <laughs> are you with me? That's what the world wants. Believers that are sold out to Christ. My prayer is that we can learn to walk in victory that whenever the enemy comes, we have on a t-shirt that says what? Jesus on board. And that changes things. Bow your heads with me. Father, my prayer this morning, God, is if there's one here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, if there's one here that have not as of yet said yes to you, if there's one here, God, that's been wrestling, that's been struggling, this morning, God, I am praying that as the altar is open, that they would come saying, I want to know God like that. Help me in my struggle. Help me in my challenge. Help me in everything that I'm going through. So, God, your word is sharp, it's powerful. And God, we all came today to hear a word from you. We came today because you want to grow. We want to be strong. We want to be more like you. So God, draw. And for those of us that know you and we still fail and we struggle, strengthen us, God. Strengthen us. Strengthen us, God. We give our hearts, we give our time to you. Move in this place and be God in our midst. And bless and have your way. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen.